Battle of Saipan is fought beginning on June 15, 1944, and fighting continues through July 9th, the point at which the island was declared secure. But during the battle, U.S. ground combat forces encountered intense resistance from the Japanese island garrison of just over 30,000 men. The U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division and the 4th Marine Division struggled during this battle against a Japanese island force that is intent on hanging on and causing very high casualties. The battle plan for Saipan was straightforward. It called on establishing a beachhead using the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions at Chalankanoya, just down there. They were to then push into the interior and seize the airfield. 32 hours after the landings began, the Army's 27th Infantry Division came ashore and joined them. And then the three divisions together were to swing like a gate and push to the northern tip of the island at Marpy Point. But this required them to overcome the island's central terrain feature, Mount Tapachau, which is where we're standing right now. This led to intense combat on the southern slopes of Tapachau. And as an interesting footnote, one young Marine from I Company of the 24th Marine Regiment was wounded just down there during the fighting. His name was Lee Marvin, and he eventually established a pretty successful acting career after the Second World War. As was the case throughout the whole Pacific War, the reason for taking these islands was to build air bases. Once Americans could seize an island, develop those airfields, then they could interdict any shipping coming in to supply the other adjoining islands, at the same time run continual raids on those other Japanese airfields. Basically what you're doing then is the Japanese garrisons on those islands are left to wither on the vine and you can move forward to the next island group. The amphibious assault on Saipan was carried out by the 5th Marine Amphibious Corps, and it began on June 15, 1944, with a landing by two full Marine divisions. The 2nd Marine Division came ashore on the beaches behind me, designated red and green. And then the 4th Marine Division landed south of Afetna Point on beaches designated blue and yellow. They were followed on June 16th by the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division, which also joined the battle. When you talk about the Battle of Saipan and other similar terrain on islands in which the Marines and soldiers fought, you're really talking about a ground war and infantry arms. In the terrain such as that of Saipan, they needed the suppressive fire of the Browning automatic rifle to be able to pin down enemy positions, provide covering fire so that Marines could advance. After sunset on July 6th, before dawn on July 7th, what was left of the Japanese garrison here on Saipan launched a massive bayonet assault against positions that were occupied by the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 105th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division. And for this attack, the Japanese threw everyone available into it. Some had weapons, some didn't, some were even recovering from wounds sustained earlier in the battle for Saipan. And what they may have lacked in overall quality, they certainly made up for in quantity because it's estimated that there were between three and 5,000 of them. The sheer weight of the Japanese attack was simply too much for these two U.S. battalions, and they were overrun in a very intense battle. So intense that the Americans afterward began to refer to this place as Harry Carey Gulch, acknowledging the suicidal characteristics of the Japanese assault. A visit to this place today can be both interesting and spooky because the remains of battle are still here. You can find things like sake bottles, rice bowls, GI flashlights. Here is a piece of what they call pierced steel planking, also known as Marston matting. Sections of this could be used to uh, produce a temporary runway. You also have part of the bayonet for an M1 Garand rifle. I don't know if it's the M1905 16-inch version or the M1 10-inch version, but it is a grand bayonet nevertheless. You can also find some small arms ammo. There's some right there, but here's what is obviously a 50 caliber cartridge casing. It's so corroded that I can't see the head stamp to see where it was made, but that's definitely 50 cal. 
But in addition to these artifacts, you also find something a little bit blood chilling here. In this little pan, you can see there are human remains. And the presence of human remains here today, over seven decades after that terrible night, testifies to the intensity of what unfolded here. Want to know what's happening at American Rifleman? Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We'll be right back. After sunset on July 6th, before dawn on July 7th, what was left of the Japanese garrison here on Saipan launched a massive bayonet assault against positions that were occupied by the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 105th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division. The two battalions that were here for the night of the Banzai Bayonet Charge numbered about 1,000 U.S. Army soldiers. And although their casualties were high, the tales of bravery and heroism were many. And among them, three particularly stand out because it was in this very confined space on one night that three U.S. Army soldiers earned the Medal of Honor. And they were 29-year-old Captain Ben Salomon, the battalion surgeon for the 2nd Battalion of the 105th Infantry, 45-year-old William O'Brien, who commanded the 1st Battalion of the 105th, and one of his soldiers, a 28-year-old private by the name of Thomas Baker from A Company. Baker engaged the Japanese in hand-to-hand -hand combat to the point that his rifle was battered to uselessness. And then, after he was wounded and two of his comrades attempted to evacuate him, he refused. He didn't want to risk their lives. All he asked was that he be given an M1911A1 45 caliber pistol, which they did, with eight rounds in it. The last time he was seen alive, he was calmly facing the foe, firing that pistol. The following morning, when more U.S. Army troops moved into the area to police up the battlefield, they found Baker's body, and in front of him were eight dead Japanese soldiers. He had used each round to kill them. And only after that, when he ran out of ammunition, was he killed. And it all happened here, in this place that's now calm and serene. One would never guess that this was the scene of one of the most intense battles of the war in the Pacific. The Japanese soldier in World War II was a soldier that was accustomed to winning. The Japanese soldier, regardless of how well educated he was, uh, was put through a fairly brutal uh, form of military training. And it really stressed that the, the soldier needed to do all he could for his emperor, uh, for his nation. And that led to a very different kind of war because the Japanese soldier wasn't interested in just going home, which of course he was, but the Japanese soldier had a, a bigger mission, and that was to fight and die for his emperor. A tragic episode in the Battle of Saipan unfolded beginning on July 9th, when Japanese civilians by the hundreds committed suicide by jumping off of the cliffs here at Marpee Point. We believe that about a thousand of them did this, and their deaths were in addition to the astonishingly high combat casualties from the battle. Between June 15th and July 9th, 25,000 soldiers and sailors from the Japanese Imperial Army and Navy were killed in action. On the American side, 3,426 made the ultimate sacrifice to recapture Saipan. And it all ended right here. In an episode that provided ominous foreshadowing of what the United States could expect if it one day had to invade the Japanese home islands. The Japanese, had they not put everything, say, all your eggs in one basket with these continual bonsai charges, which trying to break the Marines and, and the Army and drive them back into the sea, had they reserved their forces, they could have tied down U.S. forces for much, much longer and made it so much more difficult that it could have prolonged the war so that the Americans would sue, hopefully, as the Japanese thought, would sue for peace. The Japanese garrison of Saipan numbered just over 30,000 Army and Navy troops. The Army force was under the command of Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, 
And the Navy contingent was commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, the same Nagumo who had commanded the Japanese mobile striking force during the attacks on Pearl Harbor and at the Battle of Midway. But by July 6th, after the failure of the large-scale Banzai charge, organized resistance was no longer possible on this island, and both commanders committed suicide. Admiral Nagumo went first, killing himself with a pistol shot to the temple. And then on July 10th, the day after U.S. forces declared Saipan secured, Lieutenant General Saito ended his life by carrying out the ritual of seppuku here at his last command post near Marpee Point. 